Hey, what's up everyone? In this video, I'm going to show you how to extract the graphics from a Super Nintendo game. And I'll also teach you the basics of soldering along the way. Now this is going to be a fun video because I actually don't know what game this is. I covered the main chip with tape to prevent others from simply googling the number to find out what game it is. And as you watch the video, you'll start getting some clues as we closely analyze the video game board, its chips, and the data. Go to the comments section and write down what game you think it is. The winners will get a special shout out in my next video. So anyway, let's begin. So this right here is a Super Nintendo video game board. It's what you would find if you opened a Super Nintendo video game cartridge. You'll notice that the board has five components. The two chips are called mask ROM chips. They are essentially memory storage with data permanently written to them. Think of them as memory cards that you can't erase. The big one holds the game logic and the graphics, while the little one serves as an authentication chip. This was to prevent other companies from making unlicensed games. Basically, if the game did not have this chip, it would not work. The third component is a capacitor, which serves to stabilize voltage, and the fourth and fifth components are resistors, which are used to prevent excessive current from flowing through. Now if we take a closer look at this board, you'll see that it is nicely cut and uses high quality components. This gives us our first clue that this is a first party Super Nintendo game. Let's compare it to a third party Super Nintendo game like this one. You'll notice that they use cheaper quality materials and the board is not cut as cleanly. Another clue is the year the game board was manufactured. Next up I'm going to remove the main chip so I'm going to need a few tools for this. Solder holder special solder cleaning sponge, 110 volt 60 watt soldering iron or better, helping hand clips, special solder tip cleaner, solder wick to help remove solder, solder sucker to also help remove solder, some solder, either conventional or lead free should be okay, although I think most of these boards use conventional solder, which might contain some lead. Flux, this is to make soldering the chip back much easier. New solder tips. And I do also normally use puncture resistant gloves, which you'll see me wear later in this video. Next, I attach the board to the helping hand clips with the pins facing up. One has to be very careful handling these boards because they do have sharp edges and a lot of pins. I need to ensure that the base is also stable because otherwise it might tip over during the soldering process. Next I make sure the soldering iron tip is clean. Now I tried cleaning off the tip but it felt that replacing it was the better way to go. Anyway, I plug in my soldering iron and use the highest setting which is 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I get my solder sucker ready by pressing it all the way down until it clicks. Once the solder iron is hot, I put the tip on one side of the pin and wait for a few seconds until the solder melts. 
Once I see the solder melt, I place the solder sucker over the pin and press the button so it sucks up the solder. I also make sure to empty the old solder into the trash. Then I just sort of repeat the process. Now this was taking a very long time so I decided to use some solder wick. This is another tool to help remove solder. The way it works is you lay it over the solder and place the soldering iron on top of it. The idea is that the solder will stick to the wick and you sort of do this plenty of times until all of the solder is removed. The solder sucker was actually more effective so I went back to that. After a very long time and a lot of patience, I finally removed all of the solder. I used a plastic frying tool to carefully bend the pins back slightly to make the chip easier to remove. Alright, so in this next step, I'm going to read the data off of this chip. But before that, I make sure to unplug the soldering iron. Now I use this GQ 4x4 Universal Programmer, and back in the day, developers would use something similar to this. You plug in the USB cable, and download the software that comes with it. To place the chip on the reader, first lift the lever up and make sure the small dimple on the chip is facing up. Then carefully lower the chip making sure it aligns with the bottom edge. Once you have the chip seated, close the lever to lock it in place. Alright, so once you have everything hooked up, open up your USB programmer application and click on device. Now here you're going to type in the EEPROM type. So to get this information, you can look up the game online and it might match it up with the correct EEPROM chip that's used. Or you can look at the EEPROM chip that you have and just Google whatever it says on there. And there are plenty of resources online that'll tell you the type of EEPROM chip that's used. Now, it really depends on the Super Nintendo game because some Super Nintendo games use different EEPROM chips and some Super Nintendo games use multiple EEPROM chips. So again, it really depends on the game. Now for this one in particular, I know that this one works really well. So this one here, M27C4001 is the correct one for this EEPROM chip and chances are this one will work fine for plenty of other Super Nintendo games too uh, but again it just really depends another really popular one is like the 27C series uh, these here are pretty common for like NES games but anyway this is the one for this particular game so I'll just click on that one and then I'll click on select All right, so after that, you're gonna wanna click on read. And then after about a minute or so, it'll read all the information that's on the EEPROM chip. All right, so once it's done reading the info from the EEPROM, go ahead and click on buffer and you should see a bunch of random hexadecimal numbers like this, okay? Now, if all of this is full of Fs, like if it just says F, 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 then that means something went wrong and it didn't read the information from the EEPROM correctly, okay? So it should look something like this. So what you wanna do next is click on File and Save As, and we're gonna save this information as uh, let's call it mystery SNES okay and then we'll click on save and so I saved it onto the desktop and here's the file so it'll generate this file here okay so this is a dot bin file bin stands for binary and what we can do with this file 
is we can open it with another application called YYCHR, okay? And if you scroll down, you'll see that it gives you different examples for different graphics. This is pretty much an application that interprets the binary code and shows you the graphics on that file. So all we have to do now is just drag and drop it. And we're gonna see a bunch of noise here, right? So this doesn't really mean anything, right? And the reason for that is because we still have to change this graphic format. So it, it all depends on the game. So we're dealing with Super Nintendo games, so we need to change it to this 4BPP SNES slash PCE. BPP stands for bits per pixel. So we'll click on that. And, oops, let me change it back. Yeah, 4 BPP, okay. Now you'll notice that it still has a bunch of noise, right? It's just a bunch of random stuff. And the reason for this is because, remember, there's only one chip on the board. So this chip is going to contain both the logic and the graphics. So this right here is probably just the in-game code. Okay, so this is all the logic. And the application thinks that this is supposed to be like graphics. But if we keep scrolling down, we should see the graphics for the game somewhere. Let's see. Yeah, so right here. So you see all the graphics right here? So see, it says Mole Patrol, Blasters. Okay, I know which game this is already. <laughs> so um, I'll give you guys another hint. It, it it's a first party game okay it came out early on into the super nintendo's lifespan and uh what else mm, okay if i give you guys this hint you might guess right away but it was used with a peripheral okay um so yeah i mean these are the graphics right here for the game um you could also change up the the colors of the sprites like if you click on pal set that usually fixes a lot of the sprite colors it might not be the like the correct ones but you know as long as you could see the graphics and make out all the different sprites and everything so here we have the little alien here it says select games it's got the little uh, blocks here okay if you know which game this is, then you'll you know what the blocks are used for and everything. Here's the score. Player one, player there are two players. Yep. Stage mode, mole patrol, blasters. Okay, here's some of the in-game text. Alright. And I think that might be it. So yeah. You might you might be thinking like, oh that's you know, that those aren't a lot of graphics. Now you need to remember these games were very small, okay, in terms of size. So they had to reuse a lot of these sprites and, uh, you know, like rotate a lot of the sprites, change color, and then reuse them. So even though there are very few sprites here, this is what pretty much makes up the graphics for the entire game. So it's pretty incredible with what a lot of developers did back in the day. So mad respect. For those people but uh yeah that's how you extract and read the graphics from a super nintendo game so up next we're going to actually solder this chip back onto the board okay so let's go ahead and do that okay so now i'm going to solder the chip back onto the board if we look at the board, you'll notice that there is a little U-shape on the right side of where the chip used to be. This is where the chip's small dimple should face. I need to be extremely careful when I align the pins with the holes, making sure I don't have my fingers on the opposite side. Otherwise, I run the risk of getting hurt, which is also why I wear puncture-resistant gloves. I carefully push the pin onto the board, again, making sure my fingers are not close to any of the holes where the pins come out. I can't stress this enough.
Anyway, once it's back on the board, I use something called Flux. Flux is a special chemical that is placed on top of where you're going to solder. It basically makes the soldering process much easier because it helps with bonding the solder to the board contacts. Typically, I would use a small paintbrush to apply the flux, but I didn't have one, so I just used some tweezers. I actually ended up applying too much, which made the soldering kind of ugly, but it'll still work. So yeah, I just put the soldering iron on one side of the pin and feed a small amount of solder on the opposite side of the pin until it covers the contact. And I just repeat this until all the pins are covered. Anyway, that is all for this video. Hopefully you found it entertaining and educational. Were you able to guess the correct game? Leave your guesses in the comments below and I'll make sure to include the winner's names in my next video. Thanks.